Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Propane Tankless Water Heating in Commercial Building Applications webinar. Uh, all attendees are in listen-only mode. However, if you do have any questions along the way, you can type them in the questions chat area of the GoToWebinar panel. We may cover some of them along the way, or we'll have some time at the end to address any additional questions. Now, uh, the most common question asked is if this webinar will be recorded, and the answer to that is yes. A link to the recording will be provided to all after the webinar ends. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, but within that time, I would also like to share a polling question. Now, please do choose one of the following answers that best applies to you. Jamie Lyons, our speaker for today of Newport Partners, has over 20 years of experience with evaluating the performance of a wide variety of building technologies. He conducts modeling analysis, monitors building systems in the field, and performs energy, economic, and environmental analysis of building technologies. Jamie works closely with many builders and designers, product manufacturers, utilities, and code officials in his work. Lastly, he holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's in environmental engineering. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic over to Jamie. And take it away, Jamie. Very good. Uh, thank you, Preet, and thanks everybody for joining us for part of your day here to dive into the topic of propane tankless water heating applications for commercial buildings. And you should be able to see my screen at this point. I'm going to dive right in. So uh, as the group should be aware that the content of the course is registered with both AIA and GBCI uh, to be eligible for continuing education credits. And if you selected that option when you register for the course, you can look to see some follow-up information on getting your continuing ed credits. Uh, material is copyrighted. Okay, so here is the, uh, that fun text paragraph nobody really feels like reading right now, so we'll, we'll just paraphrase it. Uh, what we're going to get into today is understanding the sort of the role and the significance of water heating in the commercial building segment. Along the way, we'll learn a bit more about the commercial building segment, like the types of buildings, how they use energy, and what the energy use trends look like as we project forward. Uh, and then we'll dive into tankless technology and we'll understand uh, some of the key value propositions for using tankless water heating uh, technology in commercial building applications. And then finally, we'll round it out with a little bit of information about how uh, ga gas and propane tankless systems in commercial buildings can help with achieving uh, LEED certification for those building types. The course objectives uh, sort of line up with that overall description. First off, we'll talk about the commercial building segment, uh, understand what building types are in there, and then we'll look, take a sort of a drill down look at some of the energy use data that's available to understand how those buildings use energy. Uh, then we'll talk about the operational and installation benefits offered by tankless systems. Uh, we'll look at the energy efficiency advantages of that technology. And as I said, we'll look at uh, the contribution that tankless systems can make towards lead certification for commercial projects. Uh, so jumping right in, uh, let's take a look at the U.S. commercial buildings market and how it's composed and how uh, those building types consume energy. So the, the definition of commercial buildings is, is sort of one of omission. It's uh, any structure that is not residential, it's not manufacturing, not industrial, nor agricultural. So what's left is a lot of those building types that you would think of as being commercial buildings, spaces like offices, warehouses, uh, mercantile, religious worship, education, et cetera. As we look at the pie chart here, the most common types in terms of number of buildings uh, start with office at 18% and work their way down to warehouse, storage, service, mercantile, and on through the pie chart into some of those smaller slices. And then we, as we start thinking about how these buildings use energy, uh, there's some interesting data out there uh, to tell that story. Uh, the first thing we'll look at is the fact that if we look at the energy use per square foot, sorry about that, 
we look at the energy use per square foot, that dashed uh, black line up top, uh, on a per square foot basis, commercial buildings have been using less and less energy dating from 03 up to 2012. And you might scratch your head and say, well, why are we stopping at 2012? Uh, the short answer is that the best available commercial building energy consumption data that's out there comes from a, uh, a resource called CBEX, Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey. It's run on a six-year cycle, so the most, the latest edition of that, which will be 2018, is not yet published. So we can look back and see, well, the, the normalized energy use per square foot in commercial buildings is dropping. But at the same time, overall electricity and natural gas use, those are those blue and yellow lines, uh, they've actually been increasing a little bit, and uh, in fact, by about 7%. And what's driving that is simply that there's more buildings. There's 14% uh, increase in the number of buildings over that time frame and a 22% increase in floor space. So, of course, they're going to use more energy. Uh, but the energy is only ticked up since 2003 by about 7%, despite the, the size of those increases. So the, the energy increase has been mitigated to some extent by more stringent codes and standards on buildings and equipment. Uh, new buildings added to the stock generally are conducting less energy intensive activities. And a lot of the new buildings that are entering the market tend to be in more temperate regions where the, the heating and cooling loads might be a little more modest. So that's helped, the, this collection of factors have helped uh, sort of dampen the growth in commercial buildings energy use. If we look forward, uh, there's a there's a, uh, a data analysis product called the Annual Energy Outlook that goes all the way up to 2050, and it projects what energy use will look like in the commercial segment uh, all the way out to that date. And we can see by uh, the black line, which is electricity, that's expected to rise. Uh, it's not a, an extreme uh, annual percentage increase, but it is an, an, an increase. And again, it's driven by more buildings, more floor space. Uh, it's moderated somewhat by the buildings being more efficient over time. And grid electricity will be uh, also not increasing quite as quickly because there's a prediction there'll be more rooftop solar. On the gas side, uh, there's also an increase that's projected. That's the blue line. Uh, and it reflects increases for energy use in things like space heating, water heating, which we'll talk about today. And uh, the projection on natural gas also indicates that there'll be a rise in combined heat and power deployment. CHP systems are predicted by the annual energy outlook to grow in their, uh, how commonly they're deployed in the field. So that, that would drive greater gas use to fuel those systems. We can also take a look at the current building stock of all those commercial buildings. And, and ask the question, well, how are they currently using energy based on the end use? And what we see here, uh, you see that one really prominent bar on the bar chart, that's space heating. So that's really the dominant energy end use in commercial buildings today. Uh, and then we have this whole sort of second tier down there uh, that consists of lighting, ventilation, refrigeration, cooling, cooking, and water heating, which we'll highlight there. Overall, if we crunch the numbers, water heating represents just about 7% of total energy consumption by commercial buildings. So it's not the biggest slice, but 7% of all commercial building energy use is still a pretty significant amount of energy. And as we'll see over the next few slides, some buildings uh, within the commercial segment, like lodging, water heating represents a really large share of their energy use, uh, far more um, than just uh, 7%. So on that note, this slide is a nice graphic to show that of all the commercial buildings out there, there's really this subset of buildings uh, consisting of lodging, healthcare, mercantile, education, food service, and office. Those six building types really dominate hot water energy use in the commercial segment. And it sort of makes sense. You, know, you think of lodging and hotels, all the hot water for the, the showering. Uh, maybe there's a restaurant. Maybe there's a laundry facility. Uh, it makes sense that these building types are sort of the dominant hot water users in the commercial segment. And overall, if, if we add up the numbers, uh, collectively, this group of six building subcategories uses 85% of all 
water heating energy use in the commercial segment. And relative to all commercial building energy use, that's 6% of all commercial building energy use is con consists of water heating for these six building types. So throwing a lot of numbers out there, the takeaway is that water heating energy, particularly in these building subcategories like lodging and healthcare, uh, is a big target for energy use and therefore energy savings. As far as where that water heating energy, uh, how it's fueled, how it's sourced, that's what we see here. Uh, so for those six building types, lodging on down to office, the blue chunks of those bars indicate the extent of water heating energy coming from natural gas. The black is electric, uh, the gray is other, uh, sources like district steam and fuel oil. It's important to note uh, that propane isn't captured in this data set by EIA. So it's not as if it doesn't show up. It's, it's simply not captured by their survey that they conducted back in 2012. Uh, so it would probably be you know, somewhere on the order of electricity, maybe greater. Uh, natural gas would still be the, the, uh, the predominant fuel source for these buildings water heating. And electricity, you can see that little thin black bar, it's typically 10% or less of the energy that's used by these buildings for water heating. Uh, a couple last slides showing some of the data about the segment. If we want to know what, what building types by age are using water heating energy, it, it, it's reasonable to, to think that, well, most commercial buildings are older. They were built two, three, four, five decades ago. So there's a lot of stock that's uh, you know, 30, 50, 70 years old. And therefore, there's a lot of water heating energy out there with those vintages. And that's what we see here, that by you know, vintage, that that uh, era from 1970, 79, represents the largest chunk of commercial buildings that are using in terms of water heating energy. Um, and again, the takeaway here is that there's a lot of buildings that are on their second, third, fourth water heating system and they wear out over time, so there's this continual need to upgrade. And given the energy use that we've seen over the last few slides, it's a big opportunity. It's, it's not insignificant to, to increase energy performance by 10% on the water heating because there's a lot of energy at stake there. Uh, so it's an important opportunity that comes up in existing buildings as their water heating systems age and need replacement. Okay. Next, we'll jump into the commercial water heating uh, technology and learn a little bit about that and then explore how it's used in commercial buildings. So a real quick sort of tankless 101 is shown on this slide, uh, just sort of the basic sequence of operation, how tankless systems operate. Uh, the first thing that happens is we need hot water. There's some sort of demand for hot water, maybe to shower in a uh, hotel. So that initiates cold water, that blue line flowing up into the tankless system. Uh, this triggers combustion to begin within the tankless, so we're adding heat. Um, and that's, that combustion is using natural gas or propane as the fuel. Uh, in some units, the incoming water may be preheated using the combustion exhaust heat to extract additional heat out of that combustion exhaust to preheat the water. Uh, in the heat exchanger, the main heat exchanger, water is brought up to the temperature set point. And then the combustion, this is a very important, the combustion can mod modulate to match the flow. So if there's more hot water demand flowing through the tankless unit, the combustion can match that so it maintains the, the temperature that's needed. And then once that demand ends, uh, the tankless unit turns off. So those are sort of the real quick basics of how the tankless uh, performs and functions. So, the first really big value proposition for tankless that is described over the next several slides is the ability of tankless systems to have a flexible capacity and sizing to meet varying hot water demands. Uh, a lot of the systems that we'll look at in the case studies that, that lie ahead are very modular. They're, they're a larger array built up of smaller building blocks of tankless units. Uh, in some cases, these tankless modular building blocks are, they have an individual capacity of maybe 199,000 BTUs per hour. Uh, but as we stack these modular building blocks together, they can reach far greater levels in terms of capacity. Uh, the flow rates can range from you know, a few dozen GPM up to hundreds of GPM. So it's really important 
because so many commercial building types, they have wildly varying hot water demand profiles. So it's important for them to be able to ramp up and scale back as needed. Uh, another key feature we'll see is these systems don't store hot water generally. So they avoid what we call standby losses. Standby losses occur when I have a boiler or a large tank style water heater storing, uh, let's say 500 gallons or 200 gallons of hot water. Eventually that, that heat from the water wants to uh, dissipate and the water tends to cool off to the surrounding environment. So we fire the unit again to keep it at temperature. Uh, and that, that continual cycle of cooling off and reheating uh, is what we call standby loss. And then this last bullet is important. Uh, most tankless systems in the commercial market have the ability to use controllers which spread out the usage of, of the different modular units. So we're not always using uh, unit A uh, when there's a hot water demand. Instead, the, the, the duty cycle is spread out over the entire array. So the life cycle, the overall array is optimized. We're not wearing out one unit really fast. We're spreading that duty cycle out over the entire array. And then over here on the right side, we just see sort of a, a quick schematic example. This top, top picture, uh, we have low demand. So we have two, uh, you know, just a small two unit tankless array. And to meet that low demand, we just need one of the units operating at half capacity. Then demand starts increasing. So that unit ramps up to about 80% of capacity and it's still meeting the demand. And then, the demand increases still further. Maybe there's two, three, four, five showers occurring now. And at that point, uh, the second unit cycles on. The first unit throttles back a little bit. And so the system is modulating to meet the hot water demand that it's seeing within the building. Uh, here's some real data that sort of drives home that point. This is a 81 room hotel, which is mostly occupied, has a 90 pound laundry facility. And we can see, based on the chart, that the vast majority of the time, 87% of the time, the, the flow rate, the demand of hot water is zero to five gallons per minute. That's most of the time. And then you can see as we work our way down the chart, the higher and higher demand rates are less and less common to the extent that once we're at that uh, demand rate of 20 to 25 GPM, that happens just a small fraction of 1% of the time. But the takeaway from this is storage type water heating systems like a boiler or, uh, or tank style water heaters, they have to have the capacity to be able to ramp up and meet and supply the water uh, to meet that design condition. Uh, that ends up driving systems that have to store a whole lot of hot water, even though it's needed uh, very rarely, but they have to have the capacity to meet that peak condition. So here's our first example we'll look at. This is a hot water retrofit in a hotel, which happens to be located uh, in a really lo lovely area just outside Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. And with that natural resource nearby, this facility, this uh, lodging facility called Ruby's Inn, uh, gets a lot of tourism traffic. And oftentimes these tourists will show up uh, towards the end of the day, sometimes on a tour bus. So there's dozens and dozens of folks uh, coming into the hotel, and a lot of them want to get a, a hot shower at the end of that day. So for the retrofit, the, the facility was really struggling uh, to keep up with that peak demand. They had five high-efficiency uh, tank water heaters, 100 gallons of, of storage rated at 199,000 BTUs each, uh, but they really were struggling to keep up with the demand. So the solution for the retrofit was to uh, Designed and installed banks of propane fired tankless units. They have that modular design. You can see there, there's quite a few units uh, lined up with each other. They have that cascading operation, so they, they spread out and share the duty cycle across the entire array. And these tankless units provide uh, the, the hot water for 700 guest rooms, the restaurants, the laundry, and a, a few other applications throughout this facility. And at the end of it, the benefits that they've seen are a sizable 30% energy savings, uh, which has penciled out to roughly $6,000 per month in fuel savings. And then that, that bottom bullet there is really interesting. Uh, because of all the cold showers, because of the unhappy guests who got the cold showers, 
there was a lot of room refunds happening with the older system. So they've been able to avoid a lot of refunds. They estimate uh, $60,000 approximately in refunds that were had to be given out because the old system just couldn't meet the demand. Here's another uh, lodging example. This is a residence hall at a college, Milligan's College in Tennessee. 64 dorms, up to 120 residents. Same kind of thing. They, you know, there's a lot of time when there's very low demand for hot water, but then you have these high peak demands with all those residents. Uh, so before the retrofit, they had a single 80 gallon, 199,000 tank style water heater, and then 200 gallon storage tanks. Uh, so roughly uh, 280 gallons of storage capacity there. Even with that, there they were unable to meet the, the peak demands with water supply. Uh, the efficiency wasn't that good, and they were having leak issues. So the solution in this case was a new system for the retrofit, consisting just of three tankless units. And you can see the picture on the left is the, the pre-retrofit tanks, which took up a lot of space. They had a big footprint. And by comparison, the, the wall-mounted tankless units in the retrofit uh, are much more space efficient. Oh, they're not storing any water. They have a total capacity of 750 kBTU uh, and a very high thermal efficiency at 96%. Because they can scale up, scale down, they can modulate their meeting the, the hot water loads, uh, and they, have, uh, they avoid standby losses, and they're offering that cascading operation. So I alluded to it a minute ago, but besides the flexible sizing and capacity, another key benefit that tankless can offer in some of these applications is that space savings and the compact design. Uh, we see more and more commercial projects where space is really at a premium. Uh, nobody, you know, building owners and designers don't get excited about a bigger mechanical room. Instead, they want to increase the space of key features, key amenities, that uh, serve the building's uh, key services and the people using that building. So water heating size, as you can imagine, it, you know, it can get really squeezed. Uh, if, if water heating, that service can be made smaller, that's a good thing from a design standpoint. Um, and besides just the footprint, being able to get units in and out for replacement and for maintenance is also a key consideration. So tankless systems offer some major benefits in, in these uh, in terms of space uh, relative to storage systems, which have a much larger footprint and they, they need uh, heavier machines and sort of logistics to get them in and out of building spaces. So some of the options for tankless uh, locations and mounting are shown here. They can be self-supporting on their own stands. Uh, they can be wall mounted, as you see there in the middle. And on the right, uh, that's like a, a corner configuration where they're wedged in at a 90 degree angle into a corner. So here's an example uh, a hotel, a residence in by Marriott in Alabama at 130 rooms. So the, it was undergoing a renovation, and the original renovation specs called for two boilers at 750 gallons each and 750,000 BTUs each. The footprint of those boilers was 5 by 12. And as the design went along, the mechanical room could barely hold those units, but with very little clearance between the units themselves and between the units and the walls. Uh, There's a great quote from the plumbing distributor. We could barely make it work. But here's the kicker. If one unit ever needed servicing, both would need to be pulled from the space because there wasn't room to do the work. That in turn would mean taking the entire hotel offline with no hot water until the maintenance was finished. So as you might imagine, the hotel ownership was not so crazy about this option going completely offline with hot water anytime boiler maintenance was needed. So tankless was sought out as a better solution. They ended up with a 17-unit tankless array uh, rated at 199.9 BTUs, KBTUs each. 12 of these units were banked together uh, to serve the 130 guest rooms, and then the other five handled the dining area and the laundry within the hotel. Uh, all the units are rated at a 93% efficiency. So they end up with a wall-hung layout, which got them the space savings that they needed. Uh, and because they're wall-mounted, they're easily accessible. Uh, they can be serviced uh, without that, without the uh, 
having to take the hotel facility offline like the other system had uh, had that handicap. And the the overall capacity is very scalable uh, from as little as 11,000 BTUs per hour all the way up to over 3 million as the various arrays of tankless units can scale up and scale down. And all of that comes also with avoiding having to store 1,500 gallons of water, which was another feature of the proposed retrofit system. Uh, another space savings example is a new construction hotel. Uh, this one located in Syracuse, New York, a Fairfield Inn, 108 guest rooms. So again, the original design was too big. They were looking to use two storage tank water heaters. Uh, it didn't fit within the allotted footprint of the mechanical space, and it was over budget. So the solution ended up being tankless design consisting of three units, two of them at 750 KDCU for the guest rooms and their water heating, and then an additional 250,000 BTU unit uh, for the laundry system as a boost. And one last uh, space savings example. This is kind of a unique one. This is actually a restaurant in Georgia. And as a restaurant, they needed a lot of hot water. They need that water at a certain temperature to meet health code uh, requirements. Uh, and they offer like a head start on bringing water to boil for cooking in their large kettles. And the existing tank was not doing a great job there. It was taking them 30 minutes uh, to bring water up to a boil uh, from the starting point that the water heater was giving them. But the option of adding a water heater really wasn't, in a, wasn't viable because they simply didn't have the space. So tankless, again, is a good solution for the space savings aspect. Uh, they installed uh, a single unit, just a 199 kBTU, 30, uh, with a 96% uh, efficiency rating. It can easily provide that water at 140 Fahrenheit to meet their sanitation and cooking needs. And now, because of the output and the temperature, uh, the time to boil for cooking is 10 minutes as opposed to 30, so a lot more productivity in the kitchen based on that. And as you can see, they also got space savings because not only did they remove a tank, they were able to slot the tankless unit up in the ceiling space where it could be, uh, it could be ducted and the venting was there. They ran the gas lines up there, so it's totally out of the way, and they ended up gaining floor space as opposed to consuming more floor space. Uh, next item we'll look at, we, I just alluded to it, is the venting. Uh, any of these tankless units, uh, venting is important because unless the unit's installed on the building exterior, uh, they, the combustion gases need to be vented to outdoors. Uh, and this can matter. Uh, the details on how to do this can matter because they can affect the installation cost, the complexity, the space needs, uh, and also building penetrations are a consideration if we have a lot of tankless units and they all need separate penetrations through the building envelope, that's a, an issue, and maybe even aesthetics come into play. So it's worth talking for a couple minutes about some of the venting options which are available. Uh, the first thing to point out, and we'll, we'll show a, an example of this in a minute, is just the ability to have common exhaust venting, and that's what we see here in the schematic, that uh, we, when we have an array of multiple tankless units, like you see here, there's four individual uh, modular units, they can share a common exhaust vent, which will reduce the space needs for the, for the venting, uh, can reduce labor materials, and instead of having multiple penetrations to the shell, we can uh, perhaps just have one. Here's an example of that. We're jumping back to the, Mar uh, the Marriott uh, Residence Inn in Alabama. If you might recall, there were 17 tankless units here. 17 individual vents wasn't going to fit. Uh, this was a space-constrained installation, as most installations are. 17 separate venting pipes wasn't going to work. So they ended up with a fan-assisted common vent that did all the venting for two tankless banks. And then one uh, last tankless unit was individually vented. So they ended up with three penetrations, three runs, as opposed to 17, uh, which made the building owner happy because they had far fewer penetrations. The aesthetic look was better. And you can see that common vent up there at the top of the picture. Another option just to be aware of is concentric venting. Oh, sorry. Uh, with concentric venting, we, ha we have a, a single pipe, which is double walled. So combustion air can come in part of that pipe while exhaust air 
is is blown and exhausted out through the, the center part of the pipe. So as you might guess, this lets us use one pipe where previously maybe we needed to use two. So again, there's less material, fewer penetrations, and we can reduce space needs. Uh, some tankless units draw their combustion air from outdoors, and that's, vet, that's uh, piped directly to the tankless units. Same kind of thinking, instead of an individual uh, combustion air pipe for each individual tankless unit, they can share a common combustion air header like we see here. Uh, it's just worth, worth pointing out that the features for venting that are available will depend on the manufacturer and the design. So it's a good thing to check with the manufacturer and the plumbing engineer just to see what's possible. But the takeaway is that there are a number of different uh, venting solutions that are generally out there and available to optimize the design. And the last key benefit uh, we want to talk about is the efficiency. So it's critical. We talked a few minutes ago about all the energy that is consumed by water heating in, in several commercial building types. Uh, and efficiency can be a huge motivation to go with tankless, but it's not the only one. We looked at the modular design and the flexible uh, capacity to meet load, looked at the space savings, looked at some venting options. Um, so now we'll talk about efficiency, but it's, it's sort of one benefit in a toolkit uh, that tankless can offer. Uh, part of the, the efficiency benefits that tankless bring to the table is, is the no standby losses, which we've mentioned several times, but that, that sort of gives tankless a good head start. They're not burning fuel to keep stored hot water hot because they don't store hot water to begin with. Uh, and that fourth bullet is also uh, worth pointing out that a number of tankless units are condensing, meaning they extract additional heat out of the combustion gas and transfer that heat to, to water heating so they get a little more energy output out of the combustion of the fuel. And as a result, they're more efficient units. A, a quick shortcut to identify energy efficient tankless units is simply to look for the Energy Star label. Uh, and within the tankless arena, Energy Star labels both commercial units and residential units. Commercial are classified as being over 200 kBTU per hour. And uh, for those units, Energy Star requires at least a 94% thermal efficiency. On the residential side, they're under that 200 kBTU level, and Energy Star labeling requires at least a 0.90 energy factor. So this label is a quick shortcut uh, to distinguish which units in the marketplace are reaching that upper tier of energy efficiency. This project example is actually drawn from the Energy Star commercial heating uh, water heater website. So that's noteworthy and they, there's a quote right up front, more and more restaurants are moving to tankless water heaters. So this was a restaurant in Metairie, Louisiana. Again, they had an older existing storage tank water heater. Uh, the replacement uh, was three, an array of three tankless units. Some of the benefits they got besides the energy efficiency uh, might sound familiar at this point. They could fill those big cooking kettles faster with really hot water, so the kitchen operations are up and running faster. Space savings, and then re reliability. The two tanks were manifolded together, and they had some redundancy, to, so they could really maintain most or all the load if one unit ever failed. Uh, here, here's a sort of a much larger project example. This is the Pala Casino. Uh, Spawn Resort, which is located north of San Diego, but it's in a mountainous region, and it's a little too far off the natural gas distribution lines to make that fuel option viable. Uh, so the owners have, haven't been able to go there. Uh, considering electric water heating, uh, the, the hot water loads at the facility are quite high, and we feel that it's well beyond the ability of electric water heating systems to, to meet those. Here's a quote from the facilities director. Uh, propane is the least expensive versus electric. We've got a lot of water we're heating. And there's also some concern about demand charges. With electric water heating, uh, commercial utility charges typically include a demand charge, which reflects the peak electric demand that occurs in a, in a given month. And if there's a lot of water heating, that can drive up that demand charge. So what they ended up doing at the, at the casino resort we see here, obviously this is an exterior installation, this large array of tankless units. 
Uh, it's a 19-unit tankless array. It serves the casino, casino's potable hot water, except for the guest room. So it serves the restaurants and a lot of the other applications outside the guest room. Uh, the tankless systems, again, they have those familiar benefits. They can scale up and down to meet the demands. They share the duty cycle. And the casino has been pleased with much lower energy costs compared to the, uh, the pre-retrofit system, which was three tank-style propane water heaters. Uh, and just a couple words about the availability of highly efficient units. There's a directory uh, online from AHRI, the American Heating and Refrigeration Institute. Uh, it's a free online database of all kinds of mechanical equipment. It's easy to search. And in, in doing a search looking for high efficiency uh, tankless units that meet that energy star requirement of 94%, there's at least 100 of those units listed on this directory. And those units go up to as high as 98% available from four different manufacturers. And then just another word about propane compatibility. Uh, most, if not all, natural gas fuel tankless water heaters can be easily configured to use propane. And in fact, when we look at the AHRI directory, many of the tankless models there, the commercial tankless units, are listed under fuel source as both propane and natural gas. So. Uh, the variety and the, the inventory of available tankless units is, is quite broad for propane in the same way it is for natural gas. And manufacturers typically provide conversion info to switch from natural gas to propane and how the unit is set up to do that. And we have a, uh, an example link, which is an online video from a manufacturer shown there in the last bullet. Okay, uh, last section, we'll talk a little bit about how tankless systems can help contribute to LEED certification. As I'm sure uh, most everyone is aware, LEED is a, is a rating system to signify uh, high, efficient, sustainable buildings. Uh, one of their rating systems, which is very common in the commercial sector, is LEED version 4 for building design and construction. This was updated just last year. And this particular rating system covers a lot of commercial building types, including schools, hospitality, healthcare. These are also some of the building types that use lots of hot water. One of the features of LEED V4 is that it has a minimum bar for energy performance that must be met. There's three different options to get there. Option two is sort of the, the color by numbers. It's a prescriptive way. Uh, so a project just has to meet a certain set of specs for efficiency. Uh, what they do is they point towards an ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guide um, to spell out what those specs are. So here's a quick example. Let's suppose we're using, we're trying to certify a school to be LEED V4 certified, and we want to use that prescriptive path to, say, to understand what the efficiency level of the water heating needs to look like. So we follow the steps. We go check out this ASHRAE 50% Energy Design Guide for schools. And if we drill into that, we see that gas water heaters have to be at least 95% efficient. Uh, and as we just talked about a couple minutes ago, the AHRI directory can, can give us some uh, insight on that. And when we quickly search that directory, we can see that there's over 125 tankless models that hit that 95% efficiency spec. So there's a lot of models and technology out there uh, able to hit that spec that's part of the lead rating system. Option one uh, to meeting the lead energy requirement is a little more involved. It involves energy modeling of the building, but there are consultants that do that kind of work. And if we're going with this path to lead certification, uh, once we model that building, it needs to show that its energy use is at least 5% better than an exact twin of that building, which is modeled based on the specifications found in ASHRAE 90.1. So the model is comparing your your design building to this twin of your building that's dialed into standard specifications. And it just so happens that those standard specs of the comparison building will use a water heater model at an 80% thermal efficiency. And that sets the bar pretty low. So if the actual design is using a gas uh, tankless unit, maybe it has an efficiency of 90% all the way up to 98, you could see that the model will show some real savings in the water heating category because the, the real unit is much more efficient than the benchmark. So 
so the tankless unit can end up helping the project sort of really gain ground towards meeting that improved performance that's required for LEED. Okay, just a couple wrap-up slides. We've talked a lot about uh, propane tankless water heating commercial applications, and we'll take a quick step back to think, well, does that entail adding propane supply to a commercial building? And in many cases, it does not. Uh, most of the projects we saw did not involve fuel switching. They were simply going from older storage style boilers or, or tank water heaters that had all, that they had some uh, challenges as far as uh, performance and efficiency. So as a result, the project went to tankless, but there wasn't a change in fuel supply. Uh, there are some scenarios that come up like new construction or if a facility is, is moving away from electric water heating or moving away from heating oil uh, based water heating that uh, propane storage would be introduced to the building site. So we just want to point out that there is ample guidance on that. Uh, one resource available from PERC is the Build with Propane Commercial Guide. Uh, and we also point out that local energy suppliers and propane suppliers can offer uh, good technical support in this area regarding tank sizing, tank storage, tank placement, and complying with all the relevant uh, standards from groups like NFPA. Just a quick snapshot of some additional resources uh, that we've talked about through the course. The AHRA directory is listed here. The ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guides are listed here. They were one of the tools used uh, with LEED certification. And then, as you've seen, we have quite a few case studies from three different manufacturers uh, integrated within the, the course here. Uh, so there's a rich library of case studies available that uh, you know, show actual projects and give some of the results and the specifications for those projects. And then lastly, uh, the Energy Star Commercial Water Heater website is available here if you want to check out the specifications that are required for a unit to earn the Energy Star label. So with that, we'll take a quick pause. We have a little bit of uh, follow-up information. If you'd like to visit the propane.com website that's listed here, that site can also take you to the Propane Training Academy, which is available for online learning on other uh, energy-related topics that's available as a resource off of propane.com. And then the PERC contact for this work is Jesse Marcus, who was unable to be here on this session today, uh, but follow-up questions or related discussion about this, uh, this course material can be directed his way and his email is listed as well. So Pre, I'll take a breath, but if you want to open it up to any questions that have come in, we can cover them now. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, so I'm looking here in the questions area. I don't see any posted here as of yet, but once again, all attendees, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and, and input them now into the questions uh, portion in the, the webinar chat uh, area, applet, um, and if, if a question comes to you, let's say after this webinar is over, uh, just a reminder, once again, you can send all questions over to jesse.marcus at propane.com, so I'll give that just a couple seconds here and see if any questions roll in. All right, we do have one question here. One second. Uh, the question is, can we get a copy of the slideshow for reference, Jamie? Uh, I believe they can offer a, a copy of the slideshow, but I know PERC is also planning on uh, distributing a link uh, to a recording of this uh, session, so that'll, that should be available as well. Any other questions from any uh, of the attendees? Preet, I'll just add to that as well that the uh, this course is also available on the Propane Training Academy as part of that online learning library, so it's available there as well uh, for other colleagues to take. Sounds good. And uh, as of right now, once again, I don't see any more questions, Jamie, so thank you for your time. and. And presenting all that uh, great information there. Um, one more time, there's a reminder also, a uh, link to this webinar will be uh, 
provided uh, after the, the webinar is completed. Um, and if no other questions, uh, I'd like everyone to have a great day.